Sandy Hilal is an architect, artist, and educator. Uh, she's the co-founder of the educational program Campus in Camps and co-director of Architectural and Art Collective DAR, uh, Decolonizing Architecture Art uh, Research. She's currently a visit visiting professor at Lund University, Sweden, and the title of her paper is Refugee Heritage. The floor is yours, Sam. Okay, I mean, first of all, let me continue with thanking everyone, as all my uh, colleagues before me. But I have to say that I also would like to say how happy I am to be in Beirut. And each time I am here, I cannot, actually, it comes always in the same way to me. My grandmother telling me how they were actually coming to have dinner in Beirut and then returning back again to Bethlehem. And, you know, this, when I am here, I cannot stop but thinking how it would look like if tomorrow I would take a train and come back to my parents' house. I mean, that would have been... There's an echo. Yes. I will put it down. Yeah. That would be almost... Uh, and I am actually... I took the Italian thing of continuing <laughs> to move around. So I hope to... I will control myself a little bit. But in, in that sense, you know, if if... We should not accept any less after what is going in Gaza, if not a train between Gaza and Beirut. I think that is the minimum. <laughs> we have to accept. So, and in this, I, I will really begin my lecture by promising you three stories, three invented stories indeed. I mean, yesterday we were talking about how decolonization would look like, what does it mean to decolonize. And I don't think that any of us knows what does it mean to decolonize, because the problem is that if we will take again, again decolonization in a frame, this is the uh, extreme failure. I mean, it, what we have to understand, decolonization comes from each one of us history, location, uh, traumas, uh, getting rid of certain histories because it's not always that we have to embrace certain histories. I mean, I worked with my partner, he's Italian, and he's definitely trying to get rid of certain histories. And we share that challenge of what does it mean to decolonize coming from different sites, different positions, and different ways of being. And in, indeed, in, in that sense, maybe to introduce the first story, which is the story of... Um, refugee heritage project in some way i think when we we both finished architecture in italy returned back with phds to uh, palestine and in some way i think we began for us it was hard to understand what does it mean to return back and be in a place where you are under uh, physical colonialism right and and where we understand that our struggle was to uh to struggle against that kind of uh, colonialism and therefore maybe our first instant intuitive way was what we will be doing with colonial architecture and indeed we went into modern colonial architecture and for a few years began to imagine what does it mean to turn these settlements these military camps and other things into uh, a decolonial architecture bring it back to palestinians reappropriation uh, of our own land and history. So that was the first years we began to work on decolonization. But then we found ourselves going to refugee camps. And I think that was that was inevitable, right? I mean, we, we passed from there and we understand what well, we cannot understand decolonization in Palestine without ending in refugee camps, right? So we end in refugee camps and we immediately made that connection that in some way the colonial discourse in refugee camps is to keep us all i would not say only refugees but us all and gaza is a, is a very strong witness on that as victims so we are within you know we are put within that frame of victimhood and that is the only way where we can imagine ourselves right so in in some way i guess uh, there is that uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, well, we began to think, what does it mean to think refuge beyond 
victimhoods. And what does it mean, victims? Actually, that is how we are. Th that is how Palestinians are dehumanized. Because the moment that they put us within the framework of victims, unless we get out from there, we don't have history. Right? That is the point. Yes. And, and the refugee camps are the real carrier of that because the refugee camps are a transition where they are, you are put outside of the uh, state until you will become a citizen and therefore you have the right to history and therefore whatever you are producing becomes heritage, right? So in that sense, uh, we are kept forever victims and that is why I think what we are witnessing in this moment in Western universities, they do not want to accept us beyond the framework of victimhood. And the moment that Gaza is bringing all of us, all of us, in not accepting ourselves as victims because it is pushing us to change the narration. If people are losing their life this way in Gaza, what does it mean to lose a job, right? So we are all at the forefront of saying, no, we don't accept anymore to be included within your narration. We demand to build our own narration. And that is why they are coming forward with their non-democratic, non-open public, uh, you know, freedom of speech, blah, 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 all what they are, were telling us since 30 years, right? So in that sense, I think that is the reason. And what I will be showing you is a video of eight minutes, and I'm very grateful for, we are here with Jad Tabit that has been really following us through all over that uh, project. And in some way, what, what you would see is, is a little bit that attempt of, you know, working in refugee camps, I was always very sad to see how refugees themselves would almost hide their achievements because they are worried that if their achievements would be clear, then they might lose their right to return back home. And as if they, I mean, we, we worked in a camp called the Haitia refugee camps. They have in less than half kilometer square, 40 non-governmental organization. It's, it's one of the most actively political space I have been ever in my entire life. And in some way, I think that we, we ask the question, is, does all this has history? Right? How can we actually accept that cans are not transition? Because if we want to return back home, if we want to actually have our right of return, if we will not include that 75 years of exile, we will not return. There is no time machine that will bring us to the 48. So it is our task to include that heritage. And if today you would ask any Palestinian or any Arab or maybe any, any free person in the world, what you will put at the top of the heritage list for Palestinians, the answer would be, without hesitance, refugee camps and therefore exile and villages and cities of origin. That would be our heritage. So, but we are living in a world and in a UN system that would not permit this to happen. So what we say, if we are living in that world that does not permit this to happen, why we will not ourselves become as DAR, we are a non-profit organization in Palestine, and we decided together with the help of many people to say we would like to nominate the HR refugee camp as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And you know, we just began, we are working between art and architecture. So we have the art sphere as a position. And we began to act as if we are the Palestinian state in that sense. And then we understood maybe it should not be the Palestinian state. Maybe it should be the refugees themselves. So who has the right? Then, you know, whatever you will be doing will raise a question. Who has the right, indeed, to nominate refugee heritage? as such. And then you will discover that we are living in a world where indeed it's only states that would recognize heritage. And that means that all refugees in the world are prevented from being part of history until they are part of the state. So in that sense, we decided to give us ourselves that right. We made it in a way that we invited an Italian photographer that has been commissioned by the Italian government 
to make photos of all the Italian nominated heritage sites in Europe, in Italy. And we say, can you come and make the same photos, same way, same attention to refugee camps? And indeed, in some way, we, and then when, when we bring him back after consultation with Jad Tabit, and he make the photos of the 44 villages of origin from where refugees arrive. So these all are super documented by a proper photographer. And we indeed actually also produce the dossier. So it will be ready, well, we are ready. It's, it's fully produced, fully filling uh, the, the, the files with, and, and even if we were not acting as, as official body, we invited all, maybe I can, we invited, uh, you know, a, a person like Jet Tabit with us as the consultant from UNESCO. Like, and he come back to us, gave us some advice. We went into others. So we used each, each time we were invited to an art exhibition, we were create a situation where we will discuss as if we are in, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the World Heritage Committee. So I will show you the video now. I wanted to tell you three stories, but apparently I almost finished my time for the first story. <laughs> I will go through the two very quickly, very quickly, promise. But let's see this video and then I will come back to the second story. Do refugee camps have history? This was the fundamental question at the base of the nomination of the Hesha refugee camp as UNESCO World Heritage Site. Refugee camps are established with the intention of being demolished they are not accepted to have a history or a future. They are meant to be forgotten. The history of refugee camps is constantly erased, dismissed by states, humanitarian organizations, international agencies, and even by refugee community themselves, in fear that any acknowledgement of the present undermines their right of return. The only history, in fact, that is recognized within refugee communities is one of violence, suffering, and humiliation. How then we understand the life and the culture that people built in camps, despite suffering and marginalization? The photos that you see here are part of the UNESCO dossier producing over two years of discussions with refugee communities, local residents, heritage experts, and cultural producers. Members of the camp strongly expressed their fear that the nomination would change the status quo and threaten to undermine the legally recognized right of return. At the same time, many express their desire to see refugee history being acknowledged and attempt to bring back the right of return at the center of the political discussion. We were interested here in documenting the life, the spaces, and the political structures that emerge in almost seven decades of exile. Palestinian camps are not made any more of tents, they are complex urban structure, and we don't have the right vocabulary to understand and describe this forced condition of permanent temporariness. 
In understanding today's refugee condition beyond the humanitarian crisis, refugee heritage traces, documents, reveals, and represent refugee history beyond the narrative of suffering and displacement. Hulda Qatra Attina Al Qustina Talliturmus Al Faluja Iraq Al Manshiya Al Qubayba Al Dawaima Bait Jibreen Bait Natif Allar خربة التنور راس أبو عمار القبو بيت عطاب سفلة بيت محسير الشوع عسلين صرعة عرطوف دير رفات دير الهوى لفتة دير ياسين عين كارم المالحة سطاف صوبة خربة اللوز كسلة دير عبان الجورة زكريا البريج كدنا ذكرين دير الدبان دير الشيخ جرش مغلس عجور الولج These are the names of the villages of origin of which Palestinians were expelled and now reside in the Hesha refugee camp. Israel demolished more than 300 villages in 1948 in order to prevent Palestinians from returning to their homes. Today, only a few public buildings like schools, mosques and cemeteries are standing as material evidence to the expulsion of the Palestinians. Today, these villages have for the most part been substituted with exclusive Jewish-Israeli towns, national parks, and industrial areas. Refugee camps and villages of origin are associated with the same history of displacement and disposition. They are both in legal limbo and suspended. On the one hand, the camp is a permanent temporary space of emergency carved out of the state sovereignty. While on the other hand, the village is legally defined by the Israeli state as absentee property. Despite their geographical separations, the two sides clearly have direct links and connections. Therefore, we see the possibility and the urgency of nominating the Hesha refugee camp and the 44 villages of origin as a serial, transboundary World Heritage Site according to the UNESCO World Heritage Site criteria. Is 
it's okay to take four more, five. Okay, until we get in there, actually, I, I would like now to take you on to uh, Sweden and particularly north of Sweden. A lot of time we are always told that we took our fancy Western knowledge and apply it to our local knowledge, what we learn from our grandparents. And indeed, in that sense, I almost made the opposite thing. It's like I, I took that whole knowledge that I learned from uh, refugee camps from working in refugee camps. And I began to think, what does it mean actually to be refugees here, yeah. right? I mean, instead of being refugee in a refugee camp, that is what you will find in Sweden. And indeed, the difference was enormous for me because if in the Haitian refugee camps, I was dealing with political subjects that were actually demanding everything, were discussing everything, were here I found people completely passive completely accepting the state charity in, in many ways and completely giving up with their history, with their future and, and with their past. So the question was, what indeed to do, no? I, I don't know how can I do this. If we can move to the next. Yeah, you can move. Um, and, and indeed, uh, very quickly, it's a very, very long story and it happens in many ways. So instead of saying, okay, what, where I would find that agency, and I return back to the Islamic hadith that says, الضيافتو ثلاثة أيام وما بعد فصدقة That means that you can be guest for three days. And after that, you return back to be a charity. What, you, what Western people love to see us doing, indeed. So the, the demand was, can we stay for three days as guests? Because the problem is, like, I, I lived for so long in Europe, and it feels that I can stay only if, if I behave as a good guest. That is my only frame, my only possibility. So in that sense, we began to wonder, can we really actually begin to demand what I call our right to host? And here I would like to bring very, very, very quickly, because I know I don't have time, Derrida, that is apparently, you know, we are the most hospitable people on earth. And when we are talking to the West about hospitality, did you read Derrida? Did, have you been through Derrida? And so of course I have been. So I, I got angry with the man in some way, even if he was a good one, but I just like, no, but this is Derrida, I cannot talk beyond Derrida. So I went through Derrida, and indeed, Derrida, what, what he is proposing, unconditional hospitality. He understands that hospitality in that sense is paternalism, is colonialism, and is so many other things. So in some way, keeping us as guests is keeping us as people, as victims, right? So in that sense, I understood that you can be only, you can speak about democracy only if you are able to move between guests and hosts. Indeed, that is what, what the Islamic Hadith says. If you are guest for more than three days, you are a charity. So the fourth day you become neighbor, you become something else. But we do accept being migrants in the West to be guests forever. So I began to open up these spaces I call the Madafa. Uh, can I go back to the... No, yeah, uh, uh, one more because I'm afraid to return back. I feel this computer is not treating. Yes. <laughs> so basically, I began to do these madafas everywhere in uh, in Sweden, in uh, in Europe, and that is one in the north of Sweden. For three years, people began to actually host migrants in the in the city. Began to host everyone. Began to host institutions, Red Cross, culture. Because cu you have to understand, migrants, especially in a place like Sweden, became as a great audience for their uh, because they have to check take the point of how many audience they have. So they became great audience for their institutions. And in some way, opening that up, it became a very, very important space in the north of Sweden, where everyone on Saturdays will host the sixth. Uh, so th what they will do is to choose the next host, 
and someone will be hosting, taking care of everything. And whoever would arrive to the north would know that there is a Madafa there, end up talking about documents, what to do, how to deal with life. Sometimes in that building I show you, in that modern building I show you, they might spend four to five months not knowing anyone, while doing that Madafa became a, a very quick way of getting in and, and begin to host. And they began even to demand from the mayor to come and host them, not them always going to the mayor office. I mean, it, it really created a whole different reaction in the city to the point that the migration office, after three years, decide to close it, to actually take the space away without even saying why they are doing so. And that is one of these projects that is commissioned by the state. It was actually, while it was happening, Moderna Mosaic, which is their uh, modern National Museum in Sweden decided to acquire it, so to keep that story in their heritage, closed by the migration office. Three state uh, governmental um, sort of uh, uh, organs to begin and close. And uh, But what, what this project shows you, that even with the humble act of hosting, the moment you begin, become visible on your own terms, that is not acceptable anymore because the migration officer at that point had also to adapt to the fact that you are a political subject and therefore had to step down from her or him being the savior of these victims, the savior of these charitable sort of uh, uh, subjects. And, 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 and it is a two ways sort of negotiation of positions. And indeed, it was closed. I think, for respect of time, I should not tell the third story, right? I mean, I. I yes, perfect. Okay. <laughs> Right. Thank you, uh, Sandy, and thank you all the presenters. Remember at the beginning I said that we will have a lot of time for discussion. I shouldn't have said that. Uh, but we still have time. So uh, thank you, really, all three of you. This was a wonderful panel. And thank you, the organizers, as well, because this is a great lineup. I mean, there is everything here. There is history. There is theory. There is practice. There is urban planning. There is heritage. There is archive. It's, the list is endless. And I don't know what I'm going to do with this in five minutes, but I'll do my best. So uh, all three papers are dealing with Palestine. And they're, they're, they're obviously dealing with the issues of space. But what I take away from these papers in the first place is actually something beyond Palestine and all these, you know, universal global issues that, you know, come to my mind when I was listening to uh, to all these these papers. So they are all dealing with the issues of the asymmetries of power that are embedded in issues of again urban planning, archiving, heritage, uh, 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 and 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 so on, and also the, the issues of agency, the issues of the role of planning in entrenching occupation, and again, the role of planning in contesting occupation and its political potential to, to correct certain, certain situations. So uh, again, they are talking about different spaces and times from, from Palestine, but they are also speaking to each other in, in quite meaningful uh, ways. So what I'm going to try to do is to stay with this global level, because I'm imagining that a lot of people will ask more you know, specific questions that have to do with Palestine and that have to do with these, these particular uh, papers. So uh, I'll try to be going over, I'll, I'll, I'll go over each paper very briefly. And my students here in this lecture hall, they know very well that when I say very briefly, I never mean it. But I'll try. So uh, I'll start with Nadi. Nadi, it was really a fantastic paper. And I'm not saying this because I'm also an urban historian, uh, that I'm, I have special sympathy for you, which I have. But it was, it, was, uh, it was really a great paper all the way from the Ottoman period and all the way to the end of the mandate. Uh, so Nadi's paper does basically two things. So he situates the case of Yafa within the present literature on urban planning during the uh, during the British mandate, and we know a lot about the cities like Jerusalem, Haifa, and also Yaffa, Tel Aviv, obviously. But this story that we know is, is, is almost like the same in each case. It's the British or the Zionist agents, agency that take the initiative, and then, then, then they, they weaponize, as it were, planning for political ends. So planning plays a fundamentally important role, urban planning, to, to entrench colonialism, to entrench 
occupation. So during the mandate, obviously, as we all know, there are three parallel states in Palestine. There's the British mandate, there's the, there's the Zionist agenda, and there's the Arab-Palestinian uh, state. And uh, a Zionist state is, you know, privileged and it was supported by the British to, to flourish, to grow, wh while the Palestinian statehood has been denied from the beginning. It was disabled and then uh, planning plays a fundamental role here. And the first part of your paper makes it actually the second part. I would divide your paper into three. The first part being the Ottoman final years of the Ottoman Empire and the second part being the period until the Egyptian planner comes up. Uh, but then you have this fundamental twist in the uh, 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 in the present literature in the sense that you introduce this Palestinian Arab initiative to plan the city, bringing again an Arab planner from Egypt, taking the decision in the municipal council, and I'm also particularly delighted by the fact that you brought up the beginnings of the municipal councils that are extremely important, that were founded in the 19th century, that are the fundamental representative local bodies that play the huge role in the urban modernization of the region that only in the past two decades or so we came to, we started to appreciate and still there is a lot of work to do to do in this in this regard. So uh, also I cannot help saying that Orange is your, I mean that was, a, that's this, honestly, I was born and raised in Turkey and before I heard about Palestine I heard about Yaffa Oranges. Uh, and I'm very serious about it. There were four types of oranges, Valencia, Washington, uh, Yaffa, and one in, in, from Turkey, which happens to be called Finike, Fenike, Phoenician. Uh, but uh, yeah, there is this fundamentally important component of the identity of the city, which happens to be green and which happens to be providing a natural, semi-natural green belt around the city, something that was you know, being implemented in places like Jerusalem in a quite, quite a contest in a contested manner. So again, my question will be, will be a little bit large. I want us to think at the beginning from a transcolonial perspective. So we have this double city here. We have Tel Aviv and we have Yaffa and we have within the context of British colonialism. And there's a, a, another case of colonialism where you have a lot of double or dual cities. Uh, the so-called French North Africa in Algeria, in Morocco, under Hubert Lyoté, in cities like you know, Casablanca or Algiers, and so on and so forth. There are, they are similar, but at the same time, they are quite different. Again, I want this to be a little bit of an open question. What, how would you elaborate on the similarities and differences between these two you know, notions of dual cities and their racial and colonial sort of con uh, 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 connotations? Again, more specific questions will come, I'm sure, from the audience. Uh, Hawaida's presentation actually brought to my mind a few very important issues that were raised yesterday in the opening, you know, in the keynote lecture, and before the keynote lecture, actually, first by Mona Fawaz, about the meaning of urban planning at, in such times and the complicity of urban planning historically in the region and in the world in general in creating all these injustices, imbalances, and so on and so forth. Uh, and and Mona said that she wished she were a doctor, medical doctor. She's a doctor, but doctor of philosophy. Uh, she wishes she were a doctor. And actually, I'm happy that she's an urban planner. I think in, 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 in such times, we need urban planning more than ever. And I'm going to give an example from my own field. I'm a historian. I have nothing to do with design, uh, architecture, or urban planning. And I'm coming from a field that also has been misused, abused for really horrible purposes, obviously. Thanks to the knowledge produced by some historians, a lot of crimes have been committed in this world. But this doesn't make me you know, stay away from the profession. I think the profession is still important to fight back. And it's, it's the same goes for urban planning, as far as I'm concerned. And this is, what, this is something that I was thinking about all the time when Hawaii was speaking. So archive uh, uh, being not a simple repository, but something that is shaped by inequalities and asymmetries of power. Uh, uh, in several examples that uh, that that Hawaida uh, uh, was mentioning the the, the past work of uh, of Beirut Urban Lab, uh, I mean again there are a lot of questions in my mind, but I'm not going to ask all of them. Maybe Hawaida, it would be very useful for us and for the audience in general uh, if you can compare the the work of Urban Lab in Quarantina. I, as far as I know, this notion of archiving and unarchiving unarchi came up during that post-blast recovery. And you made it clear that the scales are different. Quarantina is different from, from Gaza. What's, what happened in Quarantina is obviously different from 
uh, from, from what's happening in Gaza at the moment. But still, rather than maybe comparing and contrasting, if you juxtapose them uh, uh, and think about the usefulness of the, again, the use of or the, or the potential transfer of experiences and conceptual frameworks from one place to the other, that be that would be great. And finally, uh, Sandy's paper. This is one of the greatest provocations I've ever seen, and I mean it. It's, it's an extremely fruitfully fruitful provocation in the sense that again brings to my mind a lot of questions, but also it's a very strong political act. Uh, at an international level, at a regional level, at the level of the Palestin uh, uh, Palestinian uh, uh, question. So it's, it's, it, it's a truly wonderful uh, project. Again, it, it, brings us, it, it brings up to mind the question of what is, again, what is heritage? If heritage is, is, it, is heritage something that, is, that becomes heritage only when it's sanctioned by authorities? Is it possible to claim heritage from below as they, were, as, as they were trying to do? So we know that heritage is oftentimes about celebration of some past moments or some past personalities and so on and so forth, past episodes in, in, in national histories. But also, it's not the first time that we come across something that is deemed to be heritage. Uh, but it's bringing up memories that are not that celebratory. So we have, for example, I'm going to take you to Africa briefly, all these spaces of heritage uh, uh, that are standing for slave trade in Africa, or all the spaces of commemoration of mass murders around the, wor around the world. Or I'm going to again bring up one example from Turkey, where a notorious prison in Ankara uh, where a lot of torture and, and execution happened after the 1980 military coup into 2010. It was turned into a museum of torture, basically. Uh, the entire building was turned into a museum of torture. But what is fascinating in this case that it's not only about suffering. It's, only also, it's also about a space where life is unfolding with all its shades. It's productivity, people are not just victims, but they are also these productive agents with all these NGOs that, that she was mentioning. Uh, but also, again, uh, uh, it brings up all the, the question of temp the temporary and the permanent. So we're talking about spaces that have been refugee camps for 75 years, right? So when does something stop being temporary and it becomes permanent? In the case of the refugee camps, is it the physical, you know, shape of the of the shelter when it becomes a building rather than a tent is it temp is it permanent now or or, or what is it so it's again there are tons of questions that uh, uh, that come to my mind uh, just again very brief global sort of question has to do with the possibility of turning this project not the the project of you know obtaining or the seeking to obtain uh, uh, heritage space status from from the UN, but the, the the notion of refugee camps being heritage spaces being more globalized in the sense of you know creating these networks with other refugee communities across the world, Syrian refugees, Sudanese refugees, and 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 all the others. I'm aware that the Palestinian case is quite unique, and they are some of the oldest, if not the oldest, refugee camps in the world. Uh, maybe you've already tried this. Maybe you thought about it, but you came to the conclusion that it would be counterproductive. If you can just, again, elaborate on this a little bit, I'd be grateful. So if you don't mind, Nadi, can we start with you, and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you uh, for these engagements. And thank you to the other speakers for um, really inspiring talks. You asked me about the dual cities uh, paradigm and, and whether that's, can you hear me in the back? Yes, it's fine, okay. Uh, whether that's, or how do we read that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the history of uh, British and Zionist colonialism in, in Palestine? And I think the nuance with Palestine, I mean, the dual cities uh, literature, especially on, on North Africa, I mean, mainly this idea, you know, you have the native town and then you have the settler town. So the, you have these two separate kinds of towns, um, uh, and thus you separate the populations, etc. The distinction with Palestine is that the, the, the official occupying force is the British. And the British, I mean, the British weren't really developing towns. Uh, I mean, Haifa was, was quite an exception 
uh, because an oil pipeline came from uh, Kirkuk in Iraq all the way to, to the Mediterranean, and that's why Haifa was a bit of an, uh, an exception in that sense. But when it comes to the rest of Palestine, actually what the British did was de development. You know, you look at the city, you look at Yafa in the late Ottoman period, and then you, you look at the defunding of the municipalities that would happen uh, to Yafa, similar to what happened in Jerusalem, uh, also to uh, Nablu, other cities as well. Um, and so really it was the, the Palestinians that were building uh, when they were building. They were building their, you know, mostly residential quarters, but also some, you know, light industries. But also the other, you know, force that was building were the Zionists. Uh, and the Zionists, you know, were allowed to establish what, you know, we could call a state within a state during the mandate period. Uh, I mean, we, we, they weren't officially the state, but they were technically uh, establishing a, a state of sorts. Um, and Tel Aviv, I would say, is the exception of what the Zionists were doing in this period. Um, I mean, we need to remember here that, the, you know, the Zionist movement wasn't very interested in building cities. Right. Uh, I mean, the kibbutz project is a is a f project focused on on labor, um, uh, on communal agricultural farming, etc. Uh, and so the majority of what they were building were kibbutz. And so Tel Aviv was this, you know, uh, paradox actually for the Zionist movement from the moment of its establishment. Uh, and there was a lot of a lot of internal conflict um, within, you know, the Zionist front on, you know, the future of having uh, a Hebrew city. Um, so. So it's a bit different with, 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 with Palestine, and I think this, this layer of Zionism, that the settlers aren't car coming from uh, a metropolis, they're not coming from, uh, from France, they're coming you know, from all over. Um, and really the, the empire that, that is um, the official mandate um, is actually not interested in, in, in settling in Palestine. They have a few administrators here and there. So they're not really building. Uh, they don't have a population to, to build um, for. So it's. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a composite arrangement, but I think this is the, yeah, a more accurate, I think, description in, in the case of Palestine. I hope, I hope that, yeah, yeah perfect. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Omid. I didn't have a space in the presentation to really share the work that was done in Carantina, so I will try to um, compare, although, although the situations are not comparable. Um, and I will maybe compare the approach in Carantina, uh, which is right here, accessible site. We were able to um, practice what we claim to do a bottom-up participatory approach to recovery. Uh, People-centered, we went to Carantina, we adopted the citizen science methodology, we trained local. Um, researchers to work with us from Carantina, men, women, young, old Syrian refugees, um, old Lebanese residents in the whole mix. And they became part of the team. We worked with them. We went on urban walks. They shared with us what Carantina means to them. We held many community meetings and town halls, and the community crafted its own shared vision. We were facilitators. We were able to really do this bottom-up approach. Um, and uh, for someone like me who always claimed, you know, that um, heritage is a social construct and recovery is socially bound, and that we have to be careful with our disciplinary biases, um, I found myself working um, on Gaza with the team forced into my disciplinary corner. You know, I was not able to access the site. I was not able to um, uh, work with local researchers. I was not able to even talk to people. We tried communicating with some, um, but of course, you know, there's no electricity, no internet. It was um, really difficult. So we were forced into the disciplinary. <laughs> um, and it was very funny because I always said, you know, we should look at social memory, not disciplinary memory. We should not be historians, but be, you know, social narrators. Um, but still, I didn't want this to kind of freeze us from not engaging. And uh, the, f the initial engagement was more kind of moral obligation or a, a kind of just psychological need to engage. Um, but we became very critical of what we're doing, and we will continue to do that, and I think it will be an incomplete project uh, if it stays within the disciplinary boundary of what can one can do 
document and map and uh, etc. Uh, and I hope it stays an incomplete project until we're able to really um, engage the people in, inside and talk to them and kind of hand things over and st again become facilitators rather than uh, planners who are coming from outside um, and, and parachuting things. The um, exercise remains. So I don't think there is a fair comparison given our positionality in relation to the two sites. Um, but I hope whatever it is that we do becomes useful somehow down the road. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the Refugee Heritage Project was done indeed within a context of permanent temporaries and that is the book that we produced before the refugee heritage and we recognize that you know that that exhibition was done in Abu Dhabi with uh, with the Palestinian curator Salwa Migdadi and the moment that we moved to a place like Abu Dhabi the, the first thing that comes to us is that of course there is even a force condition of permanent temporariness and that is not only among refugees I mean you can even be a very rich person uh, very privileged very but still feeling that temporariness that that you will be ever in a condition of permanent temporariness i mean i i bet a lot of people even in beirut feel this in this moment as no they are not sure if they will be still here uh, in one year time so we yes we recognize that that is a condition that is shared by many refugees and many non-refugees but nevertheless, I think for us, it was extremely important to make it on a very specific uh, camp because it is a camp with whom we worked for 10 years. We have relations with the community and slowly, slowly, it's not, that is one of our last projects that we did in the Hesha refugee camp. And we had really to build such a relationship. We actually established a university in the same camp to begin to be able to communicate and speak in a complete different way and and ground have a similar ground and at that point when we proposed this project there was a bit of everybody was just like uh, including myself i have to say what does that mean uh, to the right of return are we doing the right thing aren't we doing the right thing and i still remember indeed it came from refugee leaders themselves to propose why not to do it as an art project because art is still having that strange situation where you can actually challenge reality. I mean, I always say art is a great place where you can practice political disobedience with hurting a little bit yourself, not a lot. So in, in that sense, there is a bit of a protection of that art world that we felt at the end of the day, if that would go so wrong, we would say that is the idea of two crazy artists and we ended there, right? So it's, it's not, <laughs> It's not going into a situation where it will go into a political ground. So in that sense, in, it was extremely important for us to deal with a very specific camp and very specific community with whom we have a very long history. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me see. Okay, we're not bad. Uh, questions? Any questions? Yes. Sorry, uh, Hanafi. I will identify myself as coming from uh, upper campus, as a sociology, <laughs> political science is there, where uh, when we think uh, when we think about uh, resolving problem and uh, how to do dialogue, and I am someone who call for dialogical sociology, we think about uh, civil society dialogue, but. Uh, but we 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 don't we we don't admit our failure. Actually, the real uh, dialogue is the urban dialogue, and this is why I come often uh, to uh, uh, to city debates to learn really uh, to how to uh, cover uh, our failure in upper uh, in in our campus. Uh, the the examples you 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 brought. Uh, Sandy is so is so amazing. I mean, in, in Sweden, and I think uh, if I compare it, for instance, to uh, uh, the million or uh, millions of dollars spent uh, 
post Nahr al Barid catastrophe here of bringing uh, NGOs to do uh, a dialogue between people uh, 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 was, was a total failure. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the real uh, dialogue in our very polarized society is the urban dialogue. Urban, I mean by that, that to think how to change our uh, uh, urban planning, uh, how to uh, how to create city without uh, w without gated communities, how how to create I would say city without uh, c camps uh, and and camps uh, uh, in as it is in Lebanon. I grew up in a, in a Palestinian refugee camps in Syria in Yarmouk, where where absolutely the camps was. Uh, in, a, in a full uh, dialogue with the city. We have the right to the city. But here, the refugee camps in Lebanon, for instance, is the antithesis of any, uh, any, uh, the, any dialogue, any, any possibility of not having this uh, tension. So thank you so much to bring this provocation. Uh, and I hope uh, we, you, you move it from Sweden to uh, our places. Thank you. Uh, yes, hello. Um, beautiful presentation, really, and it, it really is quite um, interesting to sort of get us to question this whole UNESCO and heritage and so on. I wanted to ask you if in the uh, presentation for the UNESCO uh, prize, were there any um, histories um, presented, like oral heritage? Because what we saw was just like physical. Yeah, I mean, if, if you will go through the uh, dossier, we, we indeed actually um, document uh, different people's houses and different NGOs' houses departure from the tent to uh, in, in the 60s, 70s. So we were actually more documenting through people, of course, telling their own stories because that and, and in there, maybe I would like to tell uh, the story of the mother of Isar because when we were in her house surveying uh, the house from from the tent to where it it arrives into a three floors house and she was looking at me i mean knowing that i am palestinian five minutes away from where and and at a certain point she was so suspicious and she looked at me and she says why are you surveying this we want to return back home right that was like we don't keep this and then you begin i slowly slowly un understood her f of course i i i do believe that we have to return back home but in some way, I began to tell her, but when did you build that room? And that room was built when Abu Aysar was in prison in the 82. And that other room was built when Abu Aysar was in prison in 1886. And that other roof, we did it this way. And then they make a mistake with that door. You know, it should open to the terrace. I wanted the terrace and they didn't open the door because the friends of my husband came and they didn't understand how to open it. And she began to talk with such love towards that place that she built slowly, slowly herself. And at a certain point, I asked her, but why don't you maintain both? And she says, what do you mean? And I say, you know, minimum exile of 75 years. What is the minimum compensation if not having both Dehesha and Yafa? I mean, this is the minimum that she can have. All people have three houses. Now it comes to refugees that maybe if anyone has the right to two houses, it's them, and they are not the one asking for these two houses. So what I want to say, yes, I mean, we did that kind of history, but with the houses. We narrate the stories of the built environment rather than the oral history in, in that sense. Um, thank you, Sandy, for the presentation, and it's a very uh, provocative here. <laughs> uh, it's a very provocative uh, proposition. Uh, part of me was also wondering how people were reacting themselves in the refugee camp about the proposition itself, because to me, it's not just about um, uh, the story of displacement. There's a lot of poverty and deterioration, and I'm not sure if people do want to tag themselves as people suffering from pov poverty and deterioration, like to, to make it part of their identity as refugees and to tag it as heritage. But of course, I understand that there's disciplinary bias, which Wada just pointed out to. So uh, I'm really interested in how the residents of the camp themselves dealt with, uh, with tagging a refugee camp as a heritage site. So. 
Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for the incredible panel. I had a question that's a little bit in the weeds coming as an architect for Nettie. The question being, uh, what were the perceptions at the time on the involvement, kind of, let's say, the larger moments of tension in, pa in the Pan-Arab ambitions, which are, how did other designers or planners or engineer engineers fear about the commissioning of an Egyptian architect? Uh, how did they find, was it a competition or was it an invitation? Was it a kind of effort to build solidarity? Um, I'm guessing it would have been a little too early for figures like George Savashibar who would end up in Lebanon and so on. So what was the what was the sense, both positive or negative, from the Palestinian professional community? I suggest that we take these two questions and then and then move on. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the the way that refugees to act reacted to it, it's it's different. I mean, there are people that feeling already proud of. Uh, the Hesha refugee camp. And I would say that is why we insist on the Hesha refugee camp, because it has a bit of a different story. I mean, if anybody knows the area of Bethlehem, definitely Bethlehem city is, vis there are two most visited places in the city. One is the Nativity Church, and the second is the Hesha refugee camp. I mean, when the Pope in from the Vatican came to visit <laughs> Bethlehem, he visited the Nativity Church, and he they obliged him to pass by the Hesha refugee camp. So in some way, it is, a camp that position itself as a sort of a carrier of the political right of return, et cetera, et cetera. So it has a history in that sense. And, and that project talks a lot to the people that feels that, that that kind of proudness towards their camp. Of course, I mean, in that sense, they are always obliged to narrate the camp from a victimhood point of view. And I still remember I worked in Anirwa, and they ex explicitly asked us to leave one of the roads of the camp with open sewages so we can take donors there. I mean, it is, it's, it's an issue. We have to take donors. We need a, a bad place in the Hesha refugee camp where to take and show them that. But that is not really the only story, right? So. The fact that we recognize that kind of political heritage, I, I would say, uh, physical heritage, material heritage of the Hesha refugee camp spoke to so many people in the camp. Thank you for, for this question. I think it's a great question. Um, and actually, so the work I showed here today is more the history of Yaffa. Uh, but the current work I'm, I'm, I'm doing is more the history of the profession, so of the architects and, and the planners and, and how they're exchanging the, their ideas. And so, so I, yeah, but regarding this, this very specific case, um, actually the, the Palestinian, uh, so the Palestinians by, by 1936, they establish an engineering association already. Um, and so they're quite organized, the professionals are quite organized. Um, and they have uh, reports, and so, Incidentally, actually, a few months ago, um, I had done this work on Yaffa a long time ago, and you know, uh, I was working on something else. And I'm reading the the minutes, the meeting minutes of of uh, the Jerusalem um, Association of Engineers. Um, and then one of them brought up this project, uh, and they're actually quite upset. Um, they're like, you know, this mayor of Yaffa just went to Egypt uh, to look for expertise. What are we doing here in Jerusalem? You know, he could have just come to us. Um, so we need a new bylaw uh, to actually, you know, tell the Palestinian mayors, come to your own architects and planners first. Uh, so I say that to say that, yes, I mean, the history of exchange is a history, you know, there is a positive and flowery aspect to this history. But, you know, this is also a field of fierce competition and, and people want uh, to be commissioned such, such a good project um, at, the, you know, such a scale. Uh, I think both questions are interesting, you know, why would the mayor of Yaffa first of all go to Egypt? I mean, why was Egypt uh, the, the, uh, the natural reference for him? Um, I think is, is a valid question. Uh, but also realizing that, you know, Palestinians were uh, getting their act together. Uh, Saba Shibir was too young, but his father, um, George Shibir, was in the uh, association uh, by then, and he was one of the people, you know, doing this discussion. Uh, so, to answer also that very specific uh, question. Yes, <coughs> uh, I have two small uh, question comments. Uh, w the first one is uh, to Nadi. Uh, 
I don't know, as a comment to what you said, I mean, it was usual practice at that time uh, to have Lebanese architects working in Palestine, Palestine, Lebanese architects working in Syria, Syrian architects working in Palestine, Egyptian architects. I mean, there was no such, you know, national boundaries, etc. So it's, it's a common practice. Uh, I, I know my father worked a lot in Palestine at that time. And a lot of Palestinian architects worked in Lebanon. I mean, it was a sort of, so it's not a question. But my question is uh, about the specific 1945 project that was done by the Egyptian architect. Uh, if you look, if we look at the project, I, I'm, I'm really wondering, I mean, the, o the, the planning of the old city was erasing completely the historic fabric and creating a sort of, you know, uh, 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 European type uh, blocks, etc. And then the extension was on the uh, orange groves. I mean, uh, so, so why, why this uh, approach to? Uh, I mean, it could have been uh, uh, a British architect or any other architect who had, who, who he would do maybe the same plan. I mean, this is a real question. And it's a question, since you're working on modernity, et cetera, it's one of the qu questions that we have to raise. I mean, at that time, uh, Arab architects, some, most of Arab architects were in this mood of this, you know, modern movement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they could have done the same as uh, the colonial uh, and foreign ar architects and urban planners. My second comment <laughs> to Sandy, I mean, a lot have been said about the issue of, well, uh, heritage as uh, heritage of uh, refugee camps as, you know, refugees of poor people, of I et cetera. Yeah, but the, the what has been chosen, the way it was chosen by uh, Sandy and Alessandro is a completely different attitude. First of all, they chose one refugee camp, Daishi. Uh, the two, there could have been a sort of temptation to say, well, since it's a, Syri it's a Syrian nomination, we nominate Daishi and we nominate other refugee camps, uh, uh, I don't know, Nahr uh, uh, al-Barid or, uh, or Sabra Shatila or, uh, I don't know, or uh, uh, in Syria. No, they said no. We chose one refugee camp because we worked with the people there. It's a, it's a, it's a bottom-up approach. And then, from this refugee camp, what is directly related to it are the villages of origin. So the serial nomination is a serial nomination between the Daesha camp and the villages of origin of the people in this specific camp. And this gives the whole I mean, dimension of the thing. It's not an issue of, you know, poor people, miserable people, you are very fidgety. No, no. It's a real, uh, 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 if you want, it's a, it's a real uh, 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 theo theoretical attitude, ideological attitude, saying, well, this heritage is a real heritage to be accepted, to be promoted, to be, uh, uh, I mean, this is heritage. It's not heritage of misery, it's not heritage of I don't know what, etc., etc. It's a real heritage, it has a value. It has an outstanding universal value in the <laughs> jargon of UNESCO. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that um, proposition. And I agree that you know one has to be critical when investigating these, these projects and master plans and, and uh, you know, developments, especially from this period. Um, I mean, most of these architects were trained abroad, uh, as, as you say, and you, they brought, you know, their, their education from England and, and Paris uh, into the region. However, there is, I think, um, once we look closer at some of their projects, including this Yaffa Master Plan, um, and I would say, especially within the context of still an ongoing uh, colonialism under the mandate period in Palestine, we start to see things. Uh, we start to see some really crucial things. Uh, so what we mentioned, what you mentioned about the the open spaces in the Yaffa Old City, 
So these were the aftermaths of the 36 destruction of the city. So this destruction was already there. And so they had to repurpose that space um, for contemporary use. And what is interesting is that there's already in the actual file of the master plan, uh, the Egyptian planner actually, th there's a discourse around preservation that, that he's putting to the fore, which is quite early for, for that in, in the region. I mean, when we think of preservation, we think, you know, post 70s, 80s discourse. Uh, but there is something about, you know, maintaining the character of the old city, actually. Uh, now, there are other troubled uh, parts of, of the master plan, uh, like the complete destruction of Manshiya, for instance, uh, which I, I didn't mention because. It, yeah, it, uh, I mean, we could talk about it, but it, it's too specific. Um, so there are these, you know, um, uh, there are these moments that, you know, obviously these plans also fail, like master planning fails in, in general, you know, when you, you get a planner, you know, uh, imposing a, a grid on, on a city. Uh, but for instance, in Jerusalem also, in around the same time, uh, we have the, the Arab Engineers Association of Jerusalem contesting in public newspapers, in Arabic newspapers, the British colonial plans for, for the city on the grounds of protecting uh, the Palestinian uh, villages nearby Jerusalem. Uh, so, so you have you know, these professionals also take an active stance in a very directly um, political way, but using the technical language of architecture and urban planning. And I think that's what's fascinating about what they've been doing versus British planners uh, like Henry Kendall, for instance, who, who uh, was the, the, the person in charge in, in Palestine. So, so yeah, but I agree that, you know, there is this, this also, this critique. Yeah. Hello? Okay. Um, first, I, Hueda, I mean, thank you to all the panelists, but I want to um, say a special um, so applaud and a special thank you to, to you and to the Beirut Urban Lab team and the other, I mean, this is an incredible, uh, not only project in general, but to be doing this as it's happening in Gaza is uh, a ridiculous feat. Um, so, I need, yeah. um, that said, and this is a bit of a selfish question on my part, um, you know, you talked a bit about the fact that y to really have this come to fruition in the way that one would hope, it would, you know, needs to move into Gaza and so on, which is, uh, of course, true and, and important. What if, if you could talk a little bit about uh, the hopes of what that might look like? What steps in a scenario in which one could could do that? What that might look like? What are the kinds of communities or institutions you would want to reach out to? And I said that this was partly a selfish question because I want to make sure that we can figure out a way to help make it happen. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd just be interested in, in hearing maybe um, a little bit more about that. and. Uh, Thank you for the question. I, I think it's, I don't have clear answers, but uh, uh, I want to point out to two things that I always argue that recovery takes a long time. Uh, we should not be looking for quick uh, fixes or short-term answers. These are things that will stay with us for a long time. And we have to also have build a system of agility in order to deal with this long-term engagement if we are to engage with the site. The second lesson I've learned over the years is that um, even though we argue for bottom-up uh, uh, approaches um, and engaging the people and giving them voices and empowered communities, this also doesn't operate alone, right? I mean, the top-heavy is problematic, but also pure, sheer bottom-up. We found that you need the institutional support. You need to hold governments accountable. You need to maybe even local um, governments accountable. And you need to build a partnership that's both bottom up and, and top engaged. Um, so I think if we are to put any kind of framework for long-term recovery, we have to think of, yes, um, institutional engagement within a participatory mo modality that engages the people. Now, we learned from Lebanon also that donors come with strings attached. So <laughs> uh, I can't imagine the future of Gaza without a huge amount of donor involvement, and that's going to come with a lot of uh, strings attached. So um, I, I cannot say guarantee. <laughs> it's too small to, to teach Gaza lessons. but. 
at the end, we thought that any kind of development un under circumstances of uncertainty and donor driven projects and absence of government in Lebanon, I don't know what the case will be for, for Gaza, but you need what I call the four legged um, uh, construct involving the donors, the experts or the researchers, uh, the community and the, the government. So you need to find a way to bring all four together within a shared vision. Otherwise, one of them will pull in a different direction. Um, this usually doesn't happen because people are you know, action oriented and they don't take the reflective time to build that framework. So I really don't know who will take the lead with the Gaza and if the people will have a say, uh, but I fear that the more donor driven scenario that has happened before and um, the Zionist push for any kind of a, a true recovery. So we will we might have physical reconstruction by driven by donors. Um, yeah. So what I'm saying is going to be kind of the imaginary <laughs> that will no, probably not happen. Uh, Not even jumping ahead so far as to the p point of rebuilding and recovery, which, as you said, yes. is going to take a, a very long building time. Building the and archives, is, right? Part and then waiting to see but, how it can be. Used. But before we even hit that step of right of this part of the work that you're doing now, that is partly stalled because of a lack of communication with Gaza. I guess my question was more to the part of of this of this of even getting to the we're at january 6th of even getting to sort of march in a way that's possible mm -hmm. uh in a post ceasefire scenario you know i guess my question is who would you need to engage in Gaza to be able to even get to that kind of to finish sure. that part of it we started um i mean usually we say we deal with buildings we deal with open spaces because you know they're also part of the and we deal with socio-spatial practices for which we solicit um, social narratives, right? So we only have maybe one and partial. So I think for for this to give a complete um, a story, we need to engage people inside. We have reached out to specialized experts within Gaza, uh, professors of history, professors of heritage. We established contact and we lost the contact, but I think this will be a, a complete project when they bring in their know-how and the people bring in their social narratives um, into it so we understand w how meaningful these spaces for people and we understand better how recovery should happen. I always claim that the best recovery happens through what I call shared resources. That's why heritage is always a good entry point. Shared resources, shared institutions, uh, something that brings people together because the dialogues are likely also to create diversions and contestation. So you always start with shared public spaces, shared heritage, and so on. So we contacted the people who deal with at least that side, but um, it hasn't really borne fruit yet. Um, we are in a faculty, luckily, uh, I mean, Mona pointed out yesterday that at AUB we have the space for, for freedom of thought. But we're also within a faculty that has taken an initiative to contact professors in um, Palestine, whether West Bank or Gaza, and to establish collaborative work with them by hosting um, graduate students. Uh, so some of us are taking it a bit further and maybe hoping to c collaborate with them on research of this nature. So I think the key is to really make a team that's not just me, Batul and uh, Mariam and others, but a team of um, um, citizen scientists, what I call local researchers, so that we can work together and make this um, a bit more logical and acceptable. So I feel like an outsider claiming that space and it's always a, not a nice feeling. So. No, not at all. Thank you so much. And it, it just comes to mind that like, it's also, I mean, I'm, I'm picturing it in Gaza as given the scale, just the massive amount of scale, is that it's also like 10 teams, right? So 
بدك يعني جبال فروم جباليا ترى فاح از 50 نيبرهودز اوف اوف سبيس يا Um, uh, so my question is kind of also related to the recovery part, okay. um, which is that the situation right now at its, at its best is going to end with a ceasefire and this in itself implies that fire will break out again at some point. So does this, in it, does this idea factor in recovery since we will see urban warfare, wa- warfare again at some point in Gaza, mm, yeah. especially considering donors and the donors that the Zionist entity is speaking about are typically um, Arab countries who have normalized relationships with Israel and are kind of aiding them. And this also brings me back to um, something that happened in Jenin when um, they were rebuilding it, which is um, an Arab, country that has normalized was took responsibility for rebuilding a hospital there and when they rebuilt it they actually uh, widened the roads around the hospital and I don't want to imply that this is uh, this was by mistake I do think this is a systematic decision exactly and since this rebuilding was done to this hospital Israeli tanks attack Jenin every time from that road. So they yes. is this something that factors into recovery? Yeah, that is not recovery. <laughs> <laughs> this is rebuilding, right? This is why the whole literature I went through is about how do we conceptualize recovery as a holistic, participatory, you know, um, forward, future-looking. Um, so what you're describing happens everywhere, but I, don't, I wouldn't call that or label it recovery uh, on the basis of what I presented. Um, but I also always argue that recovery doesn't start with the moment where war or disaster stop. It, this kind of correlation is problematic. Recovery may start before. I mean, look at Syria. It's still engaged in um, uh, catastrophes of different sorts. But recovery can start before uh, and can start in an incremental fashion and can start in smaller neighborhoods. And maybe that's the best way to go about it, not through a kind of master scheme of a large scale. So I want just to disrupt this correlation between a ceasefire, then we can start rebuilding and distinguish between rebuilding and recovery. Um, and I think I covered what you asked, I hope. Uh, Mona Fawaz is going to ask a question. And after Mona, we'll have about still a 10 minutes. And I would really encourage our students to step in, ask questions after Mona. Thanks, uh, Umit. And sorry to be taking the mic ahead of the students. I uh, just want to thank the panelists for amazing presentations. Um, uh, I can't help but say yes, uh, we're at AUB, and I want to say uh, Jenin was rebuilt by Qatar in coordination with the uh, Israeli army uh, in order to make sure the roads are wide. But guess what? Dahr al barid in Lebanon was rebuilt with the Lebanese army so that they can control the Palestinian refugees. So it's good that we know our history also in our very own place. Uh, it's important. Um, I wanted to, com- to comment and sort of put a provocation or a disruption to the panel. I uh, found it fascinating how all three of you are trying to connect or reclaim historical continuity sort of as a premise to position a project for the future. Um, Knowing that the future will not look like the past, and we all know that, but that historical anchorage is important. And in doing that, I wondered uh, for Nadi, the extent to which these are parallel words, right? I mean, it seems like as if there are uh, Jewish and European architects on one hand with uh, Patrick Geddes and on the other, uh, the modernist Arabs. But we know that many of these modernist Arabs were actually studying in Europe. And was there any conversation across? Were there any imaginary, maybe before 1936, of actual joint project anywhere? And I'm just being crazy, but I'm just wondering if there were conversations across the divides, not just cluster of an Arab modernity and a Jewish Zionist modernity? Or was there any conversation in the Bauhaus that existed across the borders? I don't know. I'm just asking. Um, For Huayda, 
and again in the spirit of the disruption i wonder if the map should not uh, the mapping should absolutely not extend beyond the borders of the uh, of the what is called the strip um, I think I've said that before, but I think it's important that if we're trying to project the post-Zionist imaginary, that our imaginary also in the mapping and in the conception of the platform, uh, especially because it's a disruption, especially because we're far and we kind of have that position that we do not want to uh, accept the premise of Zionism, and if you've said it beautifully, uh, as the base for reconstruction, if that's the provocation if we should really not, from now, like refuse the boundary of the wall and decide on any other kind of boundary for the mapping that is not uh, the Israeli wall. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Muna, for an indeed uh, very important and, and actually very, uh, very provocative question because the answer is messy. Um, and so I, I would say that, so for the Zionist architects working in the mandate period, uh, I mean, there were different perspectives on how to approach the Palestinian, uh, whether as, as an architecture, so the Palestinian architecture, or the Palestinians themselves. And one quite interesting example is Eric Mendelssohn, who's, you know, very famous German uh, architect, and he, he worked in Palestine. He worked for the mandate um, government. And, you know, designed many buildings, post offices, etc. You know, very modern buildings, you know, quite nice, but, you know, colonial. Um, and <laughs> he has this manifesto called Palestine and the World of Tomorrow. And, and I mean, he's, he's more into binational Zionism, which is why it's, it's relevant to, to your question. Um, and so, you know, he's friends with and, you know, reading all these uh, binational uh, or, and, or cultural Zionists, right? But at the end of the day, uh, when it comes to the position of Palestinian architecture and whatever he's doing, um, it's seen as precedent, you know, which is a very common term in, in architecture. I mean, uh, so meaning it's a still thing. It's not a living thing. It's not something that they can be in dialogue with but rather a precedent, something you look at, uh, you know, you, you, that is stuck in time, that cannot you know, match whatever you're, you're trying to do um, as a project in the present. Um, and on top of that, of course, not including the like, li likewise modern um, uh, or modernist architects and planners who are Palestinian or Arab in this case, um, who were their counterparts and were working in the country. So there was no interest in conversation at the professional level. Uh, but I think mostly, you know, picking and choosing um, selectively um, elements of, of local architecture from, from Palestine and, and the region in their projects. Um, and I think that is the core of colonial regionalism, uh, really. Not an engagement, but rather a, a very selective um, a take on local architecture based on, on a, yeah, a very frozen um, uh, yeah, uh, interpretation of, of that architecture. I hope that thank you. Uh, thank you, Mona. Definitely, you are absolutely right. I cannot but agree. But again, it is a messy situation. Um, uh, we, we were car careful not to cross a particular boundary, I think, because that new imaginary is not ours to have and i didn't feel that it was the kind of thing that we would like to do in absence of the people who live there um so the counter narrative i think is to be produced and we are just kind of uh, setting the sources it's like um we're establishing a connection with the past for the people to imagine the counter narrative of the future. So it wasn't our place to, to jump ahead. And um, we, we can, I suppose, but it just didn't feel right. And it's too early in the process for, for us to really do that. So yes, it's a very important thing to keep in mind. Can we ask each other questions? Uh, <laughs> but wait, nobody has asked you what was the third story. <laughs> no, no, I, mean, I would like to ask that uh, 
question. I mean, in some way, I, I have to say that, um, you know, when, when we were working in Palestine around decolonization, I, I, it was clear for us that it is about actually, uh, you know, a very colonial physical uh, uh, sort of struggle. But when we were in Europe, I feel that our, if there is coloniality and it managed to get into us this way, it is because, I always say, there is a great, amazing marriage between colonial and modern. And that means that, you know, in some way, they came to us convincing us that they are not coming to steal us or to actually put on us a frame or they just told us we are here to civilize you. And modern architecture played a major role in that. We were colonized in a benign way. They convinced us that this is a benign cancer thanks to modern architecture, right? So in, in some way, being in Europe, I began to think, you know, what, what did modernity did? It began to segregate us. If we are suffering now being in boxes, that is why, because modernity loves tabula rasas, you know, they always tabula rasa and put people into frames. That is what, that is the DNA of modernity, you know, in some way it is victims. You speak only as a victim. You are a master, you speak as a master. You are this, you speak as, it is a project of segregation. So my question to you, what does it mean to speak about modern, you know, it's, they, they came to modernize us. What is our role as eventually modern Arabs, if we have any role? I mean, I'm, I'm curious to understand your position in that. <laughs> This is yeah the messiest so far. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, no, but I mean, you know, I mean, critiques of modernity are, I think, I mean, you're right. You're absolutely right. The project of modernity uh, came hand in hand with the project of colonialism. I mean, these two things came together, especially to our region. However, I think there are different ways uh, that you know, the people of the regions proposed to deal with the modern age and the developments that were taking place uh, in the region. And I think the one key example, and probably, you know, there are intellectual historians in the room, they'd know much more than I would about this, but, you know, the project of the Nahda, with all the critiques that one could uh, place on that project, you know, 19th century project, a literary project, uh, but also, you know, architects in the region adapted it uh, into architectural discourse. And they were talking about an architectural nahda. Meaning, what does that mean practically? Meaning that, you know, I mean, that m modernity doesn't have to only be Western, that these people don't own it. That we could have our own version um, of this modernity. Now, that version is obviously also problematic in its own ways, right? Um, but it is something that, you know, is intersects with colonialism, but I think isn't limited by it also. So it could offer something else, you know, it could offer an anti-colonial plan, um, problematic in its own ways, right? But, you know, in its position uh, in that history was, you know, rejecting a Zionist plan, for instance, and actually putting to the four Palestinian voices. So it's, it is a mess, very messy, uh, you know, uh, situation. And I'm not, you know, I'm not doing this uh, as a defense of, of the modern, you know, I'm, I, I'm not. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important to try and actually attune to what these architects and planners, in this case, were trying to actually do. Um, how were they, how were they manipulating? I think, the language of modernity, because they had agency too, right? And they were conscious enough of what's happening in the world and could speak that language, uh, but had a political project. In this case, pan-Arabism at some point, right? In the 30s and 40s. Uh, in 1945, the first ever Arab Engineering Congress is held in Alexandria. And the first, I mean, people come to it from all over the region, uh, you know, from, from Lebanon, from, from Palestine, from Syria, from Egypt, from Iraq. And they're asking the question, of what is our role as architects and planners on the cusp of decolonization, on the cusp of you know, these countries gaining their independence? Uh, is there such a thing as an Arab style? They raised that question at, at the meeting, and they decided, oh, that's an actually a stupid question. Let's not ask it. Um, <laughs> later on, Arab style would become a main thing you know, in the 70s and 80s. Um, 
So I think reading these um, usages of these terminologies historically is helpful because it could reveal, potentially reveal, other visions, you know, other, uh, other interpretations of what modernity could do uh, for the region. So, yeah, again, messy, but there's more to it, I think. <laughs> yeah, same. So we started five minutes late, so we can finish five minutes late. Uh, let's take one more question, potentially two. Thank you. Um, this was quite uh, the panel, and thank you so much. I've learned so much from all of you. Um, I guess I have a question for, or maybe two, for Nadi, uh, and a question for Huayda. Um, uh, Nadi, I want to actually take us to political ecology a little bit, sit with the citrus groves. Um, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about this idea of city of gardens, how the ecology of the orange trees was shaping what Yaffa would become, how the Egyptian um, master plan interacted particularly with the ecology um, of the city um, or, or that kind of agricultural space. Um, the other point I wanted to <laughs> think with you about, because you mentioned really quickly that um, in Manshiya was, you know, was supposed to be destroyed through this plan, I'm an Egyptian, so maybe I'll, I'll take the liberty to talk about class uh, becoming a really important way in shaping how architecture was being framed in Egypt at the time. And I wondered how we can maybe inflect class on thinking about these processes in this moment um, as we also think about things like modernization. Um, finally, I had a, s <laughs> it's a, it's a big, but I will, um, sort of a provocation for thinking with you, Hawaida, about this incredible project that you're doing, as Noor is saying. The mapping has been incredible. I've been following it before we got here, so thank you and your team for doing it. Um, I think one thing you got us to think about today is, and not just today, because I think Mona Fawaz started out this conference talking about how people are getting emails about being part of the recovery um, in Gaza um, and the, <laughs> you know, discomfort with um, being part of that project. Um, and one of the things I, I'm just thinking about is, um, is it useful for us to think with a, such a politically inflected ter like term and the politics that comes with something like recovery? Um, and I, I just, wanted to maybe think with, you know, why not bring in ideas like sumud uh, that uh, many of us think about um, as sort of a gift to the world from Palestine for thinking about re reframing how we're talking about these processes um, and their politics. I'm just going to put it there. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for this uh, stunning, 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 stunning panel. Um, Nettie, quick question. Just to follow up on comments uh, that you made and uh, from from Sandy's provocation and following up from, uh, I think, some of what Noor was saying yesterday, is that I can't help but think about, uh, you asked us to think about futurities that historians need to unearth. I think this is a phrase you used. Uh, I can't help but think about, uh, uh, and, you, and you use the phrase colonial urbanisms, uh, we seem to be li still living in colonial time and the temporalities that uh, Noor was touching on yesterday and that you've touched on today. And so at once, I'm asking you how you think about, uh, I'm not asking you to give me hope uh, in this moment uh, for what this actually looks like, nor am I asking you to sit with the cynicism that I feel viscerally and have felt for a long time. Uh, I'm asking you to, to say more about how you see uh, getting out of colonial time vis-a-vis uh, modernity that's come up, right? Which is what you, which you've just touched on, but I guess I'm pushing you on this. Another way of asking you this question is, what surprised you in this research? What has surprised you in this research? In this, in this, looking at the colonial urbanisms from Ottoman to the Brits. On some level, you've described uh, very predictable actions by colonial authorities, the ways in which de-development has happened, uh, and you seem actually quite 
unsurprised and unimpressed by the kind of uh, mediocrity of it, right? Which we all are. But in that moment of history that you've so eloquently kind of described, was there anything that surprised you in the ways in which this played out that set uh, what we uh, rather, I think, uh, we say in political science, path dependence has played out, right? And all of this, the, these m conjunctures have played, have then set the stage for what has come decades after. It's, a, it's, uh, it's really one question, but I gave you two ways of answering it. Thank you for this. Thank you, thank you. Thank you both for, for incredible questions. And I'll, I'll start by the order of the questions. Um, regarding the political ecology question, and, and I think it actually also is linked to your class question, to the question ar around class. Um, and I would say certainly, I mean, Yafa, I mean, you see all these posts about, you know, the Yafa, are, yeah, but it was, it, was a, it was a very classist society also. I mean, Palestinian society before 48, you know, I'm not saying it was uh, an ideal society at all, actually. Uh, it was very divided, and that's why I was showing, you know, this is a working class uh, neighborhood, Manshi, and that's why, you know, later on, it, would be the one to be demolished, not Ajami in the south, which is very affluent. So that is part of, of the answer. But in terms of how the citrus industry shapes the city, and I think it's quite a unique case uh, for Palestine, because usually the way cities work, the way Mediterranean cities work, you know, you know, cities you need surplus, you know, surplus you need uh, uh, usually agricultural uh, agricultural surplus, usually coming from hinterlands that are far away, and you know, Palestine is full of villages. And so usually the city would be, you know, dependent on the surplus coming from the villages. You know, you get the olives, you get the, uh, you know, the citrus, the other stuff. But in the case of Yaffa, it's a city. But this, uh, the surplus is not coming from a distant village. It's coming from a belt surrounding the city. And so it changes the face of the city. So within these gardens, you start to see buildings. You start to see, you know, summer villas for the elites who own uh, the plantations. And then you actually see, see start, start seeing if another phenomenon, which is what is called in ac at least court records, sakanat. Um, so these were essentially uh, working class um, residential, I don't know, neighborhoods, uh, not really neighborhoods. Uh, they have nothing to do with villages, and nor are they like you know, the urban neighborhoods. They're something else. They're a third typology, if you want. Um, and the people working in the Bayarat were, 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 as wage laborers, were living in those settlements. Um, and so that is, that is, you know, one major influence that uh, this class-based structure that is based on the citrus plantations and the citrus industry physically shapes the city. Um, and it's quite interesting in, in, in the case of Yafa. About, yeah, modernism and, you know, the destruction of, uh, of space, etc. Yes, I mean, the conversation does start in Egypt. Uh, and so it's not surprising that when they bring an Egyptian planner, uh, that this is, you know, part of the proposal would be to destroy. Um, already in Majalat al-Amar in 1939, there's a, there's a special issue on village reform, right? Uh, which is very, you know, very Arab. I mean, the, the modernists in Europe weren't talking about village reform, they're talking about urbanization, right? But in the region, you know, the villages were the big question. And so village reform was the fore of modernist thinking in, in the region. Um, and not only cities. So that's, I think, part of the answer to your question. Colonial time, man, tough questions. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think one of the things, I, uh, yeah, well, very, yeah, it got really deep, uh, messiest so far, yeah. But maybe the spaces themselves, I mean, we're talking about spaces that were built as sites of utter, con you know, the, the main purpose. Uh, with the rationalization of space in general. Usually it's control, you know, the late Ottoman rationalization of space. You get these big squares. Um, um, you know, this, this very different kind of architecture and very different kind of planning happening in the late 19th century with the Ottomans already, you know. This is before, uh, uh, before the, the British even uh, come in. Uh, but, uh, uh, these spaces outlast the empire, you know. So you have buildings that were built in the late Ottoman Empire, supposed to be the symbols of the state, and then they outlast that empire, you know. Uh, and then what happens after, you know? Architectural time doesn't stop, you know. Architecture is still there, but what happens? First, the British try to reclaim them, you know. They do these ceremonial things around them, like the picture I showed. 
you know, uh, it's a different kind of colonial time then, uh, and different kind of agenda. Yeah, but then the Palestinians use them as sites of revolt. Uh, and so you get an element of surprise there that wasn't ideal for the British. So, yeah. <laughs> It's a tough question, Sarah. Um, I haven't been asked, but if I were, to, if I were asked how we can help, um, um, I don't. I'm not in the business of creating a spatial imaginaries. Uh, I don't believe in the power of the designer in that way. Um, so I wouldn't engage with that. Uh, when I do engage, I, I'm in the business of creating a framework for recovery, uh, what I call a strategic framework for recovery that uh, um, involves you know, the people themselves. So if I were to help, it would be a methodological sort of facilitation uh, proposition. Um, but to tell you the truth, um, in an ideal world, recovery will not happen without lifting the occupation. So whatever we do is going to be part and parcel of the colonial um, apparatus. So I will not touch it personally. <laughs> but um, I, I think, again, whatever will happen with the occupation being what it is, will be a mere kind of answer to humanitarian need to also give these people shelter, which is a right they have. And it's the lowest denominator that we owe them. So I think a lot of people will get involved from that entry point, you know, that we need to still give these people a shelter. We need to house them. We need to give them schools. And uh, we, we have a responsibility to do that. And I will not blame the people who will do that. And I understand them, right? But that's the humanitarian entry point to rebuilding, which I'm not personally a, a person who Get normally gets involved because those are short term, I call them band aid solutions. Um, the, the, prob the underlying problems will stay. Um, so I really don't know. I, I really don't know. And, and one always has hope for kind of a political eruption <laughs> that maybe some kind of conscious in our political leaders will emerge and that they will um, open a door for. Um, cornering the, the Zionist occupation out. But who knows? Thank you, Hawaida. I know that a lot of us want to continue. But before uh, Monafa was orchestrated a coup d'etat to remove me from this position of uh, moderator, I think we should leave power de in democratic, peaceful ways. It was a wonderful panel. Thank you all, all three presenters. Uh,